I'm telling you a story so you know what happened. I'm telling you a story because it helps me to tell it. If it helps me to tell it, then if anything like this happens to you, it may help you to tell your story. It begins on Paddington Station. I ring home to see if Eddie is there. He's nearly 19. Sometimes he's there, sometimes he's with Melissa, his girlfriend. If he's not there, I might go and visit someone else. If he is there, I'll go home and we can chat or play FIFA or Tekken on the computer. He is at home. Not feeling too good, he says. I'll be back in about an hour, I say. He doesn't seem too bad. I tell him how I've worked a new thing up in my act for my shows for children. First I tell them a story about when he was a funny, naughty toddler. And then I tell them, but then Eddie grew and grew and grew and now he's bigger than me. And something else, he can pick me up and put me over his shoulders and whirl me round and round. Put me down, Eddie, I shout. Put me down. Eddie seems to like the story. He doesn't go to bed. He's written a play. We talk about how we could get some people together to do an acted-out reading. I know someone, I say. He lies down on the sofa. It's his favourite spot. I feel groggy, he says. Doesn't watch TV. So hard to wind down after the evening work, I think. Staying up late, seeing Melissa. Kipping during the day on the sofa when he's staying with me. He gets up once to check his pager. Melissa buzzing him. He seems fed up. Aching. Just like his sister had not long before. Lying just where she had been lying. Temperature. Aching. Hey, I said, a book of riddles has come through the post. They wrote round to a set of poets and asked each of us to write a riddle. I wrote one. I read it to him. Do you get it? Yes, he said. Your bum. That's it, I said. Your bum. Yes, those were his last words. I tell him that he could take paracetamol and Nurofen, but not at the same time. Have some ice cream, I say. It'll feel cool. When I turn in, I put my head round his door to see if he's OK. He's lying on his back. You OK, I say. He nods. He's got the paracetamol. He's got the Nurofen. In the night, I hear him get up. I sigh into my pillow. I don't want to be awake, seeing as I have an early start in the morning. At about six, I go in to say goodbye. He's lying on his back. Eddie, I say. He doesn't answer. I feel his head. It's cold. I know he's dead without knowing he's dead. Eddie? Eddie? I shout at him. I ring 999. They say, pull him to the floor. I pull him to the floor. His body is rigid and cold, his arm up in the air. I've done that, I say. Lie him on his side, they say. I lie him on his side. A watery red fluid comes out of his mouth onto the floor. I tell them. We're on our way, they say. I notice red stripes in his armpits as if his skin has split open. I think the ambulance people will come and they'll do something that will make him come alive. When I open the door, they dash in and up the stairs into the room, filling the space with their uniforms. He's dead, they say. Why have you done this, Eddie, I think? As if he's done it to hurt me. I'm ashamed I did think that. But I did. In the loo, sitting on the water, there's some ice cream. He had got up in the night and vomited into the loo. I look at it and think of him getting out of bed, being sick, not waking me up to say he was sick. And then he goes back to bed for the last time he'd ever go back to bed. I have to ring everyone, his mother, his brothers and sisters, Melissa, my father and stepmother. One calls out, why didn't you take him to the hospital? Melissa says, you're joking. Of course she does. That's what we did. 
ring each other up doing crazy voices, trying to con each other. We were the police or famous people. No, I say. It's true. It's true, I say. When they arrive, we can't bear to look at each other. We had been planets going our different ways, not in each other's orbit, each aligned with Eddy in our different paths. We know we can't revolve around him any more. I hear the zip of the body bag. There were ways of figuring out how big he got, like where his eyes came to, face to face, the way his fingertips edged beyond mine, hand to hand, his wrists peering out of the end of his shirt sleeves. Now, the way the guys can't keep hold of his body bag as they try to slide it down the stairs. The house fills up. The street pours into the kitchen. People start cooking and washing up. I sit on a chair and stare at the floor. Someone says, it's like the plague. People aren't piled up on carts, I think. I'm the only person I know that this has happened to. No, we're the only people that it's happened to. No, surely we're not the only people that this has happened to. It isn't a good idea to leave him in the morgue, his mother says. We can't leave him in the morgue, she says. He'll get cold, she says. He comes back to the house. I stroke his head. His hair is still growing. A short blonde fuzz comes out round his hairline. I put my hand on his chest and it rustles. Under his shirt, they've dressed him in a bin bag. They must have cut him about to find out what had happened. I muck about with his hair. His shoes are where he left them. He lies in the front room. People bring flowers. The room smells of flowers. The room is full of flowers. I say to people that they can go in. Go in whenever you want to. Go and see him, I say. Don't wait for me, I say. Just go in and see him. There's a way we make it the loneliest moment of all. Even our eyes are supposed to look inwards. Dr Dave, who had known him since he was a funny fat baby, says he'd have drifted off, losing it without knowing it. If the meningitis bacterium gets into the bloodstream, he says, it multiplies and the antigens dissolve the membranes round the cells and the body turns to mush. But he wouldn't have known anything about it, he says. I think, again and again, and forever, what were his thoughts as his body turned to mush? Young men come, his age, 18, 19. I know some of them, and not all of them. They go into the room. Perhaps they've never seen a dead body before. And there he is, still and silent, looking bruised and swollen, that thing with the cells, I suppose, but still him. My father and Eddie's younger brother, just a little boy, come on, my father says, I'll take you in. They stand like shadows in the passage, in the light coming in through the front door. A moment's pause before my father opens the door to the front room and they slip in. It's their moment. I call Wayne and Phyllis in Chicago 30 years earlier, was it? Their Richard had been hit on the freeway. Wayne says how people are good. They do good things. I remember how a year before that we had sat on their floor and read their dear Rich book. His letters. People are good, Wayne says. They'll all be good to you, except one. I wonder about asking him. What did this one say? I ask. Wayne answers. She said, well, at least you've got two other children.
My old friends Jeff and Carol come over. They had lost their son in a road accident. I remember Jeff saying to me how it took him to the deepest point of despair, wondering, he said, what was it all for? They tell me stories of how they do things to remember their son. Some days they say all they could do was go into the woods and howl. Jeff says he found an old tree trunk and carved it. Jeff can do things like that, I think. I can't. What can I do? We plan the funeral. It's fun. It's funny. We laugh. We think of who's going to speak. What music are we going to play? We think of the different worlds Eddie moved in. His mates from school, his mates from the old hockey team he used to play for. His new friends from London's theatres, where he's been a crewman pulling up curtains, pushing on the helicopter in Miss Saigon. A good funeral. Hundreds of people. His old primary school head teacher is MC. The coffin is huge. I've never seen a coffin so big. One of the coffin bearers is his older brother Joe. A friend of mine from the BBC has made a montage of the commentaries from the Arsenal Cup finals Eddie and I and he has been to. An old friend of mine that Eddie had been talking to recently says the Kaddish. We sing the Mississippi John Hurt song, You Gotta Walk That Lonesome Valley By Yourself. I don't speak. The poet James Berry reads a poem that my father has written. Grandson Eddie by Harold Rosen. Larger than life, filling the frame of the doorway in his hockey goalkeeper's gear, a giant from outer space, larger than life. Eddie in his Arsenal shirt, acres of it across his chest, stroking it with his great hands. Eddie with his first watch in the Natural History Museum, checking the time every minute, in charge of the rendezvous by the dinosaur, making sure there's still some time left. Nowhere near enough time, we now know. Larger than life, but not large enough. A poem by my father, who a few weeks after he arrived in England from America, aged two, lost a baby brother. A poem by my father, who lost a son, a baby boy, younger than my brother, older than me, who died while my father was away in the US Army. After the funeral, it's quiet. The house is empty. I pretend that he's not dead. I say to myself, he's not here. It's the same as when he's staying with Melissa. He's not dead. He's not here. Shall I write letters to them all? I start one. Dear Joe, your wild, noisy brother is dead. I couldn't do what my parents did, bring two boys four years apart through the maze. I don't know if I'll find my way as well as they did, seeing as they lost one back near the beginning. Thank you for your card. You say to me, what can I say? I don't know how to answer that one. I don't know what to say, let alone tell you what you might say. You're right, it's a loss. It reminds me that I lost him. He was there, then he wasn't. Yes, it is unfair and cruel. It also makes me tired, with a tiredness that hangs on like a dog. It's nice of you to say you'll always remember him. I don't think you will. One of us fell off the boat. Look in our faces. Read our eyes as we come ashore. In our homes you can see that we hate surviving. There are times when we think, how easy to have been him, one wave and gone. Don't tell me that I mourn too much and I won't tell you, you mourn too much. Don't tell me that I mourn too little and I won't tell you, you mourn too little. Don't tell me that I mourn in the wrong place and I won't tell you, you mourn in the wrong place. 
Don't tell me that I mourn at the wrong time, and I won't tell you that you mourn at the wrong time. And don't tell me that I mourn in the wrong way, and I won't tell you that you mourn in the wrong way. I may get it wrong, I will get it wrong, I have got it wrong, but don't tell me. I haven't seen you for a couple of years. We meet at a friend's funeral. I remember you've had a child and you've been ill. You see me and you cry. You're overwhelmed. You ask me, how is it possible for me to carry on? I wonder if I look like someone who looks like it's possible to carry on. I wonder if I am someone who finds it possible to carry on. You, his mother said, why don't we go to Paris? Paris? Why? Something to do, you say. My old, old friend Francois has just rented a flat. Sorry, he says, but the decorators have only just finished. I'll put two sofa beds in there for you. The flat is hollow and smells of paint. The lights from the street play across the walls. We eat galette, wide brown pancakes with the nutty taste of rye. We walk into shops. I buy a plate. I buy a card. It's from an old engraving of a La Fontaine fable. A man is carrying an elephant, bending under the weight of it. He bends at the knees as well, head down, face to the ground. He's struggling to take a step forward up a mountain. Above him is a rocky shoulder, and across from him is an even bigger crag overlooking him. But he hasn't fallen over, and he's got that elephant gripped round its front legs. He's carrying the elephant. I buy the card. It sits on my desk. We walk past the gates of Montparnasse Cemetery. We walk in. I don't know why we walk in. I don't think a cemetery is where I want to be. I don't know Montparnasse Cemetery, but thousands of other people do. They're here, visiting their heroes. Baudelaire, Simone de Beauvoir, Guy de Maupassant, Serge Gainsbourg. People are leaving lit cigarettes on his gravestone. Juliet and Man Ray, the inscription reads, unconcerned but not indifferent. I'm liking this place. I feel like I'm among people, alive or dead, who know about death. I want to know more about death. Here now is a woman crying. The woman is crying by a grave. A photo on the grave is of a young man who died ten years ago. We stop. She looks at us and asks us why we're here. I say that our son has just died, same age as yours. She seems uncontrollably sad. How did your son die, she asks. Meningitis, I say. She says that her son died in a car accident. I wonder if that's harder to cope with. Perhaps there would be rage and bitterness at another person, a driver or cars or unlit roads, but not a bacterium. She goes on crying. I have a selfish, selfish thought. I hope in ten years' time I won't be as sad as she is. I imagine her crying like this every day. But afterwards I think maybe it's not like that at all. Maybe she leads a good and happy life. Maybe she eats galette and loves choosing melons in Montparnasse Market. But then every Sunday or perhaps one day every month or perhaps one day every year she comes to her son's grave and cries. Maybe that's how she does it. This cemetery is not about death, it's about grief. I've got to find out about grief. I will find out all I can about meningitis. I'll try to get to know what doctors know about meningitis. I can't have it that Eddie was taken away 
or that he passed by like a train, or that he was snatched from us. I want to live amongst viruses and bacteria, see them in my mind's eye, with us, in us, around us. They've as much right to be here as we do. Look at me, I'm nearly 53 years old. For 53 years, me and the bacteria and viruses have got along. Eddie got along with them for nearly 19 years. I start to give them brains. I say, one of them thought it would cross the membrane in his throat and get into his blood. This is great, it thought, warm and wet, wet and warm, ideal for multiplying. The more it multiplies, the more it produces the stuff that destroyed the membranes round cells in Eddie's body. Then he died, and the bacterium died with him. Not so clever after all. An evolutionary mistake. Your greatest success, meningitis bacterium, was your greatest failure. I think of bees dying as they sting. I put my mind in the way of other people who are the parents of an 18 or 19 year old who died of meningococcal septicemia. I'm precise about this. I know there are a thousand other ways to die and a thousand other ways to be the griever, but I want to know how the ones who are in my shoes are coping. I find chat groups, self-help groups. I home in on just the ones I was looking for. I feel like a vulture. I apologise. No, no, they say. We did the same. Here's a woman who's the mother of a young woman who had just started at university. And the young woman loved rowing. She was in a rowing club. She was going to be a great rower. She went out rowing. She went back to her student flat. She said she was tired, went to bed. She died of meningococcal septicemia. I eat this up. Dear Phoenix, re your forthcoming clothes sale. Thanks for the handout. There's no one to clothe. Dear National Blood Service, he was proud to have given that time, but he hasn't got any now. Dear Bank, re E.S. Rosen's account, the account holder doesn't hold anything. No, I didn't write to the bank. I didn't ever write to the bank Somewhere in the depths of the NatWest Bank are some pounds that Eddie had earned working backstage in a theatre. I see them as coins in a box marked E.S. Rosen, but I know that really they're just a digital twitch in cyberspace. Freddie ran the hockey club that Eddie belonged to, Arsenal Community Sports for Local Boys. I loved watching the games. Eddie played in goal, standing like a giant in that little hockey goal, brave and crazy, padded up like the Michelin man or an American football player. I used to bring him back garish gridiron shirts from the USA and he stood in that goal with bright coloured chevrons all over his tops. Freddie said, let's have a memorial game for Big Eddie. We have it on the same pitch where Eddie played with the players he played with. They know what to do. Freddy blows the whistle. We stand in silence. I see Eddie in the goal. He's there. Freddy blows the whistle and everyone shouts and runs about. Darren has to score so that Darren can do his cartwheel. Eddie's great friend Darren, who came over to the house and was so upset he couldn't speak. The game never ends. Every year we have the Eddie Memorial Game. The guys get older. They bring their children. Barbara, whose husband died in a car crash, tells me I'll have dreams. They'll be beautiful dreams, she says. None come for a year, then they start coming. He visits. He stands in his grey check overshirt. He knows he's died. He says he's sorry he didn't tell me that it was septicemia. I say that I'm sorry that I didn't know it was septicemia. He's at a distance in the way that I used to drop him off in Drury Lane in time for the matinee. But then he's closer. He's on the sofa doing his crazy hugs and lifting me off the ground with all his massive, indestructible might. 
When he was growing up, I used to have a dream where I'm in the water with all the children and we get into difficulty. There's a raft. I'm pushing them out of the water onto the raft, but I can't get all of them on. I turn round and I catch sight of a face struggling and I realise it's Eddie. Two days after Eddie was born, he slowed down. He became still. The doctor said he had an infection. The next 24 hours would be critical. I had to go home. I lay there on my own. I was sure he would die. I sometimes walked down Drury Lane. I let myself think I'm meeting up with him as I used to do. We go to Ed's diner, it was named after him, we'd say. The street is full. The street is empty. The high, windowless walls of the theatres stretch up and up. There's the stage door where he would have bundled out with his jacket not quite big enough, the sleeves not quite long enough to reach his hands. It's quiet. I wait. There was a joke he used to tell about a man who had an orange for his head. The man's head was an orange. That was the joke. The bit about the orange came at the end of the joke. You only found that his head was an orange at the end, but I don't remember what the joke was. And that was a joke he used to tell, the man with an orange for his head. Then I found a version of it in a magazine, so I pinned it up on our board. But later we took the board down and I lost the joke. I can't find it anywhere. I loved that joke, he loved it. But I can't find it. And I can't find anyone who knows it. It's gone. There was a joke, and now there isn't a joke. One dream, he's younger than he was when he died. He's got something that we both know is deadly, and I think he's had it before, and we're talking about him getting better. And he's being strange, old for his age, but fooling about, and I'm letting him because I know that this may be the last day he's alive and he knows that I know that this may be the last day he's alive but neither of us says that this may be the last day he's alive and I notice he's wearing his green woolen top he wore when he was very young. And now, in daylight and the dream is over, I realise that I haven't thought of this top in years. My picture of it must have been stored away in my head without my knowing it was there. But that's the least of it. It's sitting on the edge of my bed, knowing that he's not here. And that moment in the dream where I let him fool about was about loving him being here. In another dream, it turns out that a baby is in hospital, alone. No one else is there. She's sitting up in bed on her own when we get there. There's a tube coming out of her nose, but it isn't connected to anything. And the baby's sweating. Her back is wet. Soon after, the nurses and doctors arrive. I say, this doesn't look good. They say, you're right. Someone mentions fan fever. Fan fever you get from sitting too long next to an electric fan. So then they get to work connecting the tube and doing artificial respiration. It's tense, could go either way, but she pulls through. Later, I'm coming away from the place and she fits into the palm of my hand, the size of a teacup. There's a bad moment as I sit on the bus with her in my hand there. She goes still and cold, but I blow on her and she wakes up and looks around. Eyes wide open. He used to pick up cats. They liked sitting in his arms, looking out at us. I want to tell him about the cats. I think of me saying to him, I think I know why cats eat grass. Something to do with them knowing that all's not well in their guts. So they eat grass, which makes them sick. Then whatever it was that was making them unwell has gone. It's not inside anymore, it's outside, evacuated. This is not the same as the hairball 
Eating their own hair makes them sick, but that's because they lick themselves. The hair just goes in. What I don't know, Eddie, is why cats put the sick where they put it. They bring it up on our doorstep. You can tell which sick it is from grass eating and which from hair. The grass eating sick is a pool of foamy, sicky stuff with bits of chewed grass in it. The hairball sick is more solid, food mixed in and held together by a wedge of hairs. That way you can tell which of the cats has done it. So some of the hairy sick is ginger. As the sun dries it and the rain washes it, we're left with a skein of ginger hair, like the twist of wool you find on barbed wire when sheep have pushed through the fence. The mystery, though, is why the cats want to bring us their sick. It feels so like an offering, an act of kindness or generosity. But that doesn't seem likely. When you watch a cat being sick, it, it looks like they're trying to bring up their whole system. Anything could come out. A kidney, maybe. Is it a way of saying they hate us? We sick on you and all that you stand for. Or maybe they think we're mummy and they just do things like being sick when they're around mummy because deep down they know that mummy will clear it up, give them more dinner and lick them all over. Either that or just doing what you do with good friends. You can do anything with good friends. If you were at a football match and you wet yourself, a good friend wouldn't stand up and shout, Hey, look, <laughs> my friend's wet himself. He would just nod and say, Yeah, yeah, man. I do that sometimes too, even if he didn't do that. Bearing that in mind, I just want to say that cats are okay. They're good to be with. I like the way you hold them, Eddie. And that sick thing, I didn't mean to draw too much attention to it. I do it myself sometimes. Don't you? I'm doing my show at a primary school. The hall empties. And one of the teachers tells me that when she was at school, she was a girl in the same class as Eddie. She has a photo of the class when they were in year six. I don't remember ever having seen the photo before. There he is on the front row, sitting on the ground, showing us the soles of his trainers. I'm looking at it in the empty school hall. We all remember Eddie, the teacher says. I look at his face. It's that expression he had when he was listening. I wasn't there for the photo, but I imagine now that I was and he's, he's listening to me. That look where he was intrigued by some nonsense I was saying, or those times when he listened to my torment and told me to walk away from what was bothering me. And when he gave me the play that he had written, believing that I could put it on, and then when he felt ill, he trusted me to look after him. But in the end, I couldn't and didn't in the end. The silence after lasts forever, quieter than a painting. There's nothing as quiet as this. It's as quiet as nothing. The hardest bit is remembering him talking about the things he wanted to do. He was going to be a comedy chef, he said. I see him in a TV kitchen making his hot chilli guacamole and saying, the first bite is with the eye, Dad. And that play he wrote, I did help him put it on, but that was after he died. Bloody music. I hate the way it infiltrates its nasty line in eavesdropping on what's going on inside, good spying. It knows when it can make you open the can, uncork the bottle, break the seal on the jar, all the nooks where you'd hidden the raw, unchewed material. It hoiks it out and waves it about in front of your eyes. Look and remember, it says, you thought you could lock it away? Can blood hide from a cat? Can petrol hide from a flame? No more shall it be concealed. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. We're travellers on the road, always on the road. 
sometimes joined by strangers who become friends, who join us for a while, a day maybe, maybe more, then we part. Maybe they've another road to go on. Maybe it's us who turn off. Either way, we don't see them again. I know people I've walked with for years. They're ones I knew from when I was tiny. There are the ones I knew from when they were tiny. Some join, some leave, some head off, go on ahead, looking back over their shoulders. Sometimes they let me catch up. There's one who left altogether. He was with us for as long as he could, and oh, he kept us laughing on the way. His jokes, his faces, his noise. He took up half the road, you know. He lost his life. His life was lost. We lost his life. I'm losing his life. My dead boy once made a clock. Instead of numbers, he put 12 letters that spelt how time flies. It fell off the wall and broke into pieces. <laughs> hey, how time flies, he said. Here are the pieces. I'll stick them together. Sometime.